Babies in the womb who are given life-limiting diagnoses like trisomy 18 are often aborted, with doctors and activists insisting that this is the easiest and most compassionate choice. But the truly loving and healing and redemptive option is to allow these babies to be born whole and to live. But parents in this situation, they need support. They need information. They need community. They need help. And that is why Able Speaks exists. This is a Christian nonprofit organization that helps families who are pregnant with a child that has been given a life-limiting diagnosis. You are going to be so encouraged and touched by the testimony of the founders of Able Speaks, the Crawfords, who are here today to talk about their baby boy, Abel, and to talk about this organization and everything that it offers for families. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Okay, guys, thanks so much for joining Relatable. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about who y'all are and what you do? Yeah. Yeah. You want to start? Sure. We're Daniel and Kelly Crawford. Um, We are the founders of an organization called Able Speaks that exists to support families who have chosen to carry a child with a life-limiting diagnosis, just with the hope and the vision that um, each family in that scenario, every parent can choose to cherish that child's life and experience um, hope and joy, even in the midst of sorrow and uh, potential grief and loss. And so um, that mission and that organization stems from our kind of on-ramp into parenthood, our journey with our firstborn that we can certainly share more about. Yeah. Um, but that's certainly what led us to get connected with you and be here today. Yes. So Abel Speaks, tell me about the name of the organization and why it's called that. Sure. Yeah, so it comes from Hebrews 11, 4, and it says, uh, through faith, even though he is dead, Abel still speaks. And so um, Abel is our first son, like Daniel mentioned, and um, had a life-limiting diagnosis. And so um, we didn't even know that was necessarily in the scriptures until um, we picked his name. And Mm. then actually at his celebration of life, the pastor read that verse and it just really um, obviously stuck out to us that even though his life looked different than we had hoped or imagined, um, that the Lord was like using it um, in profound ways in our in our journey, um, but also uh, the ripple effects of his life uh, with the people around us and the people that um, we shared his story with. And so yeah. like had read Hebrews, obviously, and even like had the memory of like, oh, yeah, right. Hebrews 11. Yeah. That's yeah. where they list like. Yeah, a lot of the examples of faith from the Old Testament, but had not read through Hebrews eleven at the time right, where right. we were like thinking through names. We were yeah, like, yeah. I always like uh, for people they're like, oh, we chose this name, which means this yeah. when yeah. you break it down, and we're always just like, here's just the names on our list. We liked them, yeah. and so we didn't overthink it. Yeah. But in the long run, yes, as we were um, getting to a point in our journey where we had thought about formalizing, yeah, the kind of support that we now provide. Um, that popped out as an opportunity and something that really embodied um, the essence of what we hope to do. And let's go back to finding out that you were pregnant with Abel. What Mm -hmm. year is this? Uh, It was the summer of 2015. Okay, summer of 2015 and normal pregnancy, I assume. And then at what point did you get Abel's diagnosis? Yeah, so um, we are people of little patience, and so we wanted to find out gender as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And Especially with your first. Yeah. It's just fun to yeah. know. It is. It's For fun. Sure. Um, and so we decided to do the blood work um, at 10 weeks to find out gender. And um, we're like vaguely aware, you know, that they were testing for other abnormalities, yeah. but it really was like not on our radar. Um, right. And, and you so you kind of just don't, you don't even know. They're like, no, oh, we're testing for genetic yeah, stuff. Yeah. And you're like, okay, good. I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Um, and then we waited two weeks to get the results back. And so our OB called. Um, I was at lunch with some friends actually. And she just said, hey, we got the results back and you're having a little boy. And um, he also has risk markers for um, something called trisomy 18. And I said, okay, well, what does that mean? And she said, if the diagnosis holds true, then he's considered incompatible with life. Mm. And I was like, okay. Um, 
you know, and I was asking all these questions, yeah. like how accurate is the test and which she wasn't really familiar with how the test worked and how accurate it was. And, um, and then just didn't know a lot about the diagnosis. And so she just said, you'll have to go to a maternal fetal medicine specialist to um, get more information. And mm. so um, we did that about a week later um, and saw a specialist who um, said, hey, based on what I see on ultrasound, I'm 99% sure your son has trisomy 18. Mm. And so you guys can just terminate the pregnancy and try again for a better one. Wow. Um, was and you said how far along did you say that you were at this point? I was about 12 weeks. About 12 yeah. weeks. Wow. And so yeah. you saw your baby on the ultrasound. She said, yep, those indicators look correct. Mm -hmm. And what did she tell you about trisomy 18? You know, really not much. I mean, it was just like, this is what the diagnosis is based on what we see. And um, he's not going to survive. And so I'm um, there's really no reason to like continue the pregnancy. Mm. And what and what is it? What is trisomy eighteen? What does it affect? Yep. Yeah, it's it's you have a third copy of the eighteenth chromosome. So twenty six from mom, twenty six from dad. Sometimes a third copy will go in. Trisomy twenty one, we know is Down syndrome, um, which is, you know, associated with a disability that um can be life limiting, but oftentimes is not. Whereas trisomy eighteen and trisomy thirteen typically are um they're they're life limiting in the sense that you're probably not looking at a normal lifespan the insinuation at the time was it's basically impossible the, these babies don't survive outside of the womb and oftentimes they don't make it full term and so there's just not even a blip of hope as it's presented and so we've obviously and there's plenty more we could share about this is that there is certainly a range of um time outside of the womb that parents can still experience with their children who have diagnoses like trisomy 18 or trisomy 13. Um, but yeah, at that time in that room, it was, uh, you know, sucks the air out of the room and you're in a place where it's really the only thing that's presented is here's what this is. Here's what that means. And here's what you do next. Right. And so, so naturally she didn't ask she didn't say what do you want to do or how do you feel about this but we recommend which is a euphemism terminating your yeah pregnancy yeah. and this was in texas and at this point this was right. before the fall of roe so right. this was legal right. to do yeah what was your reaction when you heard that i mean i can't imagine the whiplash yeah um you know he actually just said i'm gonna step out of the room and the nurse actually came in um she was an older lady and Sometimes I'm like, was she even real? Um, like, or was she like an angel? But she, <laughs> she just said, you don't have to make that decision today. And I was like, wow, okay. Which I was shocked that someone working for that provider with Let's the direction know. that he was giving us, you know, would be so open about that. Um, but, you know, we just, so we talked with her mostly, the nurse, and just said, hey, that's not something that we're open to considering. And, um, and, you know, she just said, yeah, I think I think that's wise just to wait. And so the um, appointment was pretty abrupt after that. And um, we, you know, quickly went home, tried to, like, learn more about the diagnosis mm -hmm. and really what um, what we could expect. Um, and I think at that point we uh, were trying just to get our minds around the fact that he really did have a diagnosis that was going to shorten his yeah. life you know I think is it takes like time to uh, process that information right and Daniel I think I, I might have cut you off earlier but what what were you thinking through all of this I mean obviously it's emotional I imagine maybe there was even like a period of denial mm -hmm. I mean I think that's how I would feel like maybe they're wrong or yeah. maybe this is the child who does defy the odds what were you thinking yeah mm -hmm. I think a few things in that moment um and even a quick caveat before i answer that is like it is the prevailing and predominant worldview of most medical providers to um give that counsel and that advice and i think that it can be taken and run with to the extent of like oh they're all like these you know evil rabidly pro-abortion which i'm sure some are oftentimes though they're just like hey here's what's best for everybody like, I think genuinely in this uh, specialist was actually a male, but in his heart of hearts, it's like, 
I bet you just think you're actually like helping us and sparing us from a hard experience and hey, what's the point if this is the inevitable outcome? And so I think you think you're doing us a favor, um, which I just like to point out. And that goes down to like education and equipping and Mm -hmm. which is why before we felt the need to create a nonprofit supporting families with journeys like ours, there was a burden and a component of, um, you know, I feel like we need to share our story and our perspective, um, which Kelly in particular has done like at Grand Rounds at hospitals and stuff, just to like create a category and a shelf in the minds of providers of like, Mm. oh, here's a parent that got the news, moved forward, had the time cherish that journey and here's how she's doing after the fact here's the sentiment she can still share which we haven't gotten to that point in sharing here yet but um i think most people just can't fathom that or it seems impossible and so um you know that was one thing in that room another thing was just being thankful in hindsight that we had been at a church um a church that did their best, you know, to balance the grace and the truth, but not be afraid to lean into difficult, controversial topics, such as the life conversation, abortion, and try to equip its members around that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so we went into that season kind of having formulated some of our theology and some of our views, um, which is just, I can't say enough, not waiting until you're in the moment to like filter through, Mm, what do I think and believe? Right. Heart versus head. And so mm. that was helpful in hindsight. And I think a, a part of the Lord's provision, which was abundant at every phase of the journey, was going into it. We had some kind of, um, you know, we knew that wasn't something that we were going to consider. And yet I understand how a parent, not only because of what I said earlier, of it's really not like, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? Here's the pros and cons. It's just like, do that. here's what you do. Mm-hmm. and to where most people that don't have that equipping or don't have that and their world just got flipped upside down okay like you're yeah the doctor um okay yeah so with all of that said um yeah i think that as we think about grief oftentimes we think about that moment of finality and there's now a resolution there's whether it's death or whatever it is we're talking about, this is that's when the grief starts. I think in these contexts, it's really in in receiving and letting the diagnosis sink in. Hmm. We didn't know how the Lord was going to write Abel's story. Um, we didn't know what the rest of that pregnancy or what time outside of the womb would look like. But we started grieving in that, not because we embrace like, oh, it's this inevitable thing. And so let's just start preparing now to say goodbye. There's some component of that um, that's really tender and hard to put words on. But there's, there was a sense of, the first thing I started thinking is like, however it plays out, it's, this is going to look different than I thought when Kelly shared with me for the first time, hey, we're pregnant, we're going to be parents. Because it's like moms and dads, there's a lot of differences, you know. For dads, it's like I'm thinking about throwing baseballs with Mm five-year-olds. I'm not necessarily thinking about, you know, the pregnancy, that that season of newborn where the maternal instincts versus the paternal stuff. Yeah. And so I think that's the stuff that I remember. um, It's like in a vacuum, I might cry like once a decade. Like, it's a problem. I need to work on it and be more in touch and familiar with my emotions and feel things. But I remember that's when it just started catching up to me. And and those were the first things that were inducing those emotions and those tears was the sense of, like, I'm not going to get to do that, probably. Yeah. And I don't know what this is going to look like, but it's probably not going to look like that. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty crushing. All right, pause from that conversation to tell you about our first sponsor for the day. I love this sponsor. It is Range 
Leather. The owners of Range Leather, Kyle and Bailey, started their leather company on their kitchen table with the goal of handcrafting leather goods that last. All of their leather products are made in Laramie, Wyoming with the highest quality leather age old techniques. They're all backed up with their forever guarantee. They've got awesome products from jewelry like earrings to wallets. I got my husband a wallet, I think, for Father's Day this past year, and he absolutely loves it. They've got belts and hats and all kinds of good stuff. It really is top tier high quality. I love range leather. Right now, they're offering 15% off all of their products when you use my link, rangeleather.com slash Allie. 15% off all their products, rangeleather.com slash Allie, rangeleather.com slash Allie. I think the point that you made about why theology matters and why knowing what you believe matters. I think a lot of times we think of these issues, issues like abortion as kind of secondary or tertiary divisive issues that we don't really want to think about because we don't think that they will ever affect us. Um, Or we think of theological debates as things that Christians really shouldn't be focused on. And maybe to some extent that's true. But when it comes down to it, what you believe in those moments acutely matters. It really matters, especially when you have someone who is in a position of authority, Mm -hmm. who is in a position to care for you and tell you what's best for you to present this as really the only way to go. And as you said, someone who doesn't have that foundation of knowing, wait, this baby, no matter what, is made in the image of God, is thinking, wow, it's really that easy? I can just be done with this next week and then start over and have a great pregnancy and I'll never think about it again? Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not reality. But in those highly emotional moments, you could see why that option is appealing to some people. Um, So tell me, after you left the room, you knew that that wasn't going to be the path that you took, Mm -hmm. but what did it what did it look like after that? How did you find the support that you needed? Yeah, yeah you know, um, like Daniel said, I, I think the theology piece, but also surrounding um, like what an abortion actually is, I think our church really equipped us on that. And so yeah. um, I think as we, um, it, it wasn't an option for, for both of those reasons, right? So I think right. it's important to... Um, to know like what God's word says and then to also have an understanding um, of what an abortion is. But Mm -hmm. yeah, after we left the hospital, um, Daniel was on staff at the church that we um, went to at the time. And, and so it was really the first time in my life that I uh, experienced like God's people really like being the church for me personally. And, um, and so a lot of that just looked like people that we had known for a long time or people that we barely knew at all caring for us, loving us. Some of that was just like, hey, I dropped coffee off your, on your front porch. And it's like, good, I'm getting out of bed for that, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, mm-hmm. and just knowing that so many people were like praying for us, I think it was really the first time I experienced um, in such a personal, tangible way the power of like prayer and how that was like impacting my heart and mind on a daily basis. Um, and so a lot of the services that we provide through Able Speaks are because those were things that people did for us and they were things that we like didn't even know we needed, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think my favorite thing about um, the way that people cared for us during that season was that uh, people really just got to use the gifts that God's given them to bless us, you know? And so, um, to see, which a lot of people ask us, like, how do we like support families that are in this situation? And I'm like, Hey, what are the gifts and skills that God's given you? Just use those, you know, and, and other people that are, um, caring for them get to do the same and together that, you know, forms, um, really solid care and support. Mm -hmm. And so, and now that it was like super profound, you know, some of it was just like texting us. Some of it was um, just giving us connections for providers if we needed them or yeah. um, giving us, like I said, coffee on our front porch or just like small things that mm-hmm. made us feel less alone, you yeah. know? 
Yeah, we um, at one point invited folks, obviously, to pray um, for us and for Abel throughout that journey, which really was just the walking through, walking into and through the unknown. Because, again, we're like late first trimester at that point. It's like, that's a long time. Yeah. If this goes full term, we're talking like several months yeah. of sitting in this, we don't know what lies ahead moment, which is incredibly vulnerable. And we, in this day and age, have such a high ability to control so many different facets of our life, where to have one glaring thing that is like, you, you really, you can prepare yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, you can have good community, you can have all these things, but there's a finite point where it's like, you can't really do much more other than wait. And we don't like that, right? Yeah. And so in that stretch, um, you know, I think that as we talk about suffering, which at this point in age, it, you know, as Kelly said, it, it was probably the first really profound stretch of um, hardship of a circumstance that had entered our lives. And nobody like opts for that and pursues that and seeks that. And yet um, we got to see not only through God's people, through God's word, as we talked about, um, through his spirit, but just the way that he draws near to the brokenhearted and just the things that maybe stories that you're familiar with, you know, if you've been around church or the scriptures that just took on color and like new light mm. and like the notion of like collecting manna one day at a time. Yeah. And it's like, that's all we can do is take it day by day mm -hmm. and trust that he's going to provide tomorrow. And we don't get a week's worth. We don't get a month's worth. We don't know what is coming down the stretch, but there's this daily sense of abiding and trusting on our end and then providing and sustaining on his end. And um, so that whole stretch, you know, as we invited people to pray, we picked just a time. Originally, his due date was January 29th. We had him on January 22nd. So okay. we're coming up on his eighth birthday, like next week. Oh my so, goodness. Uh, this was 2015. And so that was another just really special, profound thing is folks set their alarm for his original due date. They just symbolized this, you know, here's what we're going for is that's, you know, carry this baby full term and he's going to be born and um, we're going to get time with him, whatever that time looks like. And if the Lord wills, you know, shock us, do something miraculous, yeah. you know, you can do whatever you want to. Um, and yet we also know that you love this child more than we even do and mm -hmm. you created him with purpose and intention so prepare our hearts for whatever lies ahead but also we feel freedom to ask you for what we want to ask you for yeah you know right. and so there was all that yeah. but when our alarms would go off every day at 129 it was this we're thinking about it 24 7 so it wasn't like oh yeah Abel <laughs> let's pray real quick it was a daily reminder for us that it got to the point where hundreds potentially thousands um of alarms were going off every day at, at that time. Mm. And so for us, it was like, that was the reminder every day of like, Hey, for the next minute, two minutes, five minutes, I don't know. Mm. But in this moment, there are hundreds of prayers right now. Right. Like, and so many people would text us like at that time yeah. every day and be yeah. like, Hey, I, this is what I've been praying for you guys for specifically for today, which was like such a gift. I think two people, um, challenged us a lot in that season. So even like Daniel talking about like truly asking God for what we wanted, you know, um, friends asked like, Hey, do you feel freedom to ask for what you want? And are you actually doing it? You know, cause in those moments, of course, what we wanted was for him to be healed. Um, but I think even asking God for what you really want is vulnerable, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's like, we also know that that might not be our story. And so I think, um, some of the greatest gifts that people gave us were really leaning in and saying, hey, this is what God's word says, you know, do you feel freedom to do that or ask that? And um, I think that really blessed our journey um, in just like keeping us focused, you know, on like, mm -hmm. hey, we, we can. Um, and I think allowed us to look back on that time with like no regrets. Yeah. It was like the biggest that, gift they gave yeah. us in a way that emphasized like just the authenticity and intimacy that can come from praying whatever you got, whatever's on your heart, mm -hmm. not some of the stuff because people well-intended can do the like, Hey, 
if you pray hard enough or if you pray this way or yeah. if you have enough mm -hmm. faith. If you believe that it's going to happen, yeah, like it will. the ball's in your court, yeah. and then you'll basically like coax that blessing and that healing out of yeah. him, um, which is, there's so much to say about that, of how um, painful, I mean, I can't imagine wholeheartedly embracing and believing that, and then not having that prayer answered, and then the only thing to point to and look back on is, I must have did something wrong, because yeah. they said if I did it this way. Mm-hmm. So anyways, without going down that rabbit trail, it was, you know, a profound time of, you know, that literal like Psalm 23 idea of walking through the valley of the shadow of death mm -hmm. and trusting the good shepherd and having other people, you know, whose voices and whose presence were there with you to shepherd and point you back and just take it a step at a time, a day at a time to where we'll say often like that period of intimacy and connection with the Lord was unprecedented up to that point. And then really even looking back, you know, our story and journey with Abel has now changed everything about our lives, including what we do vocationally. Um, but even like replicating what those months felt like when we mm -hmm. were navigating the unknown is hard to do and hard yeah. to describe. Okay, another break. To tell you about America's only Christian conservative wireless provider, they are the only one, the only wireless provider that shares our values. They honor the sanctity of life, free speech, religious freedom, and you have access to all three major networks, which means you get the same coverage that you've been accustomed to, but you don't have to worry about funding the left when you choose Patriot Mobile. Their 100% U.S.-based customer service team makes switching easy. You keep your number, keep your phone, or you can upgrade. Their team will help you find the best plan for your needs. You just have to go to patriotmobile.com slash Allie. You'll get free activation when you use my code Allie. That's patriotmobile.com slash Allie, patriotmobile.com slash Allie. How did you find a provider that you were comfortable with given the situation yeah. and what path you decided to take? Yeah. So, um, we called our OB and said, we didn't love that experience, um, with, with, the the, with the specialist. Do you have another recommendation? And, um, she said, yeah, Hey, I think this person might be a little bit better fit for you guys. So we went to, um, see him probably two weeks after that. And, um, it was a totally different experience. And, he played a huge role in our story. Just, uh, he was really the first person that said, Hey, your son's alive today and that matters and it's worth celebrating. And so for us, we really like took that and we we're like, Hey, we are going to celebrate every day that we have with him. And even if it's just in the womb, you know? Um, and so he really, um, yeah, valued Abel's life and valued, what our desires for what his life could look like um, mm. and and valued that we were his parents. And so we get to make those choices, you know. Helped humanize him too. Yeah. Like yeah. especially as a dad who wasn't actively pregnant, that there's that challenge of like connection and everything. So for him to like, hey, let me see your hand, like put it right there and like give it a little poke. It's fine. It's not going to hurt him. And <laughs> yeah. like see on the screen, like him you respond. interacting and it's like, wow, dang. And so it really was this powerful picture and dichotomy of like what sort of sway and influence and yeah. impact yeah. people in that role can have. And we're so grateful because they're out there. Yeah. The providers that take that approach yeah. to their care and to their patients, they're out there. And yeah. you can find them. We can help you find them. And uh, it's yeah. a game changer. And that's one of the resources we provide through Able Speaks is just uh, medical connections, just because yeah. we've seen the like spectrum. We've had totally. um, not great providers, and mm -hmm. then we've had some that have had a huge impact on our story and journey. And so, um, and that's what we get to say when we get to meet with medical professionals is just like, you like have so much power to like impact someone's journey. Totally. And you get to choose if that's for good or not, you know? Mm -hmm. And so let us help you know some maybe better practices to um support them in a way that they would really feel cared for mm -hmm. and uh tell me about the days leading up to abel's birth and then what it was like when he was born yeah 
yeah, I think um, the days leading up feel like a blur kind of, you know. Um, he was our first, so we didn't have any other kids running around. Um, and so, again, like Daniel said, I think we just tried to take it a day at a time. And um, the week before, I think, which is funny, like Daniel said, we're like a week before his birthday now. Um, he'd be turning eight years old, which is crazy. But, you know, I think it's just like this weird emotion of like, I want to meet my son, but I also know that meeting him might also mean him passing. And so that's like a really, um, it's a really strange place to be. And so, um, but we really did, you know, a couple weeks before he was born, it was just like, man, we're ready. And whatever the Lord has for us, like, we're going to trust that that's going to be good. And we can't wait to meet him. Mm -hmm. And so that's true of all of our children, you know, like the excitement and and anticipation of getting to know them um, is just like one of the greatest gifts in life. And, and so that was true um, of him too, even though it looked a lot different than we had hoped. Um, We did not feel that way the whole pregnancy, you know, the waiting is like excruciating all the unknowns that you're, you know, facing um, feel just um, overwhelming. But did you um, know that you would have to have a scheduled C-section? No. So I okay. advocated for that. Um, okay. Our provider didn't want to do a C-section. She said oh. it wasn't worth it um, because he wasn't going to survive. Mm. And so um, mm. so I just said, hey, like that's what I think is going to be best for him and for our family. He had a heart condition that we were concerned he might not survive the labor. Okay. And so... Um, that was like one of my first um, experiences uh, as a mom of like, oh, okay, I've actually got to like stand yeah. up for what I, you know, what so I think is basically best. Basically, she was saying because of the difficulty that a C-section would be for you, for me, it's not worth doing something that would be better for him, right? Because he's not going to survive any anyway. long term, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. And so um, we went back and forth on that for several months, um, and then she ended up agreeing to do it. And so, um, yeah, we scheduled a C-section for 39 weeks and we weren't sure that we would even make it to that day. Um, but we did. And so, yeah, you know, I think we went into, um, his birth, just trying to hold it as loosely as we could. And what we often say is that it really felt like holy ground that day. You know, the Lord was so present and, um, it was just like palpable, his presence in that operating room. And he was born and we didn't know if we'd get minutes with him outside of the womb or hours. That's what we were told. And so he was born and stabilized pretty quickly, which was like a surprise to everybody. And then they were like, maybe he doesn't have trisomy 18. And we were like, okay. Um, so, you know, there's like all these things going yeah. on um, all at once, but did you get to hold him immediately? Did yeah, they? we immediately did skin to skin. And um, and then, yeah, we went back to just like the post-op room. And um, Daniel and I had decided to spend like the first few hours with him just as a family of three, um, which was like such a gift. But um, he was doing like remarkably well. And so our like friends and family were in the waiting room and got to come back, um, which also was something we weren't sure that they would get to meet him alive. And so the fact that they did was um, such a gift to us, even now, because they get to say, remember when Abel did this? Or remember when he looked like that? Or he had a long toe like your brother? Or like all the things, you know, that we get to talk about when we have babies um, is a part of like his story too. And so, and it just humanized him, you know, where other people get to talk about him when he was um, actually alive. But, But yeah, his birthday was such a great day. It really was. I mean, and that's what we tell families um, that we get to walk with through Able Speaks is like, it's hard to get your mind around it right now, and that is okay. But I promise, like, meeting our children is unlike any other life experience, and that's going to be true of your child even if they have a life-limiting diagnosis. And so, um, but yeah, that first day, you know, um, it was lots of family and friends coming in and getting to hold him and meet him. And, um, it was just such a, an unexpected gift to get that time with him. Mm -hmm. We weren't expecting that. Right. Yeah. I would say also 
to a degree, and I hope I speak to it like tenderly, but even the families with the hundreds of families that we've walked with at this point, you know, um, a percentage of them, you know, will experience uh, stillbirth and the sentiment still holds to a degree that candidly I, cause we prayed for that often. Like everybody's different and has these different things of like, Oh man, that's really a longing on our hearts. But we um, were very, hopeful and and wanted to do whatever we could to try and meet him alive and have Mm. time with him outside of the womb and so not everybody approaches it the same way but even for the families that don't get that time with their child outside of the womb they say the same thing which is man what a beautiful day and it's that you know bittersweet mixture of emotions because there's obviously pain and grief that comes with loss and and death um but then there's this sense of man we've been thinking about talking about praying about anticipating and like there you are and like we get an idea on ultrasound of like oh i think you might have your nose but it's like there's just nothing like it and um so we'll say that to folks you know often that we're serving because that's in of course everybody's thinking through that and there is for a good chunk most probably of the pregnancies there's this sense of like oh that just feels daunting, you know, and I'm like having to gear up and prepare yeah. for potentially saying goodbye. But then, as Kelly said earlier, when you get closer and closer, I think that does in a way that's just God's kindness on display. Like mm-hmm. it gets not replaced totally, but um, you feel this sense of, of joy and anticipation anticipation in in the positive sense of like, OK, he's about to be here. And so nobody can take that away and you wouldn't trade it for anything. And Mm -hmm. again, these are sentiments that over 400 families now that we've walked with, um, that is a prevailing universal sentiment is Mm -hmm. that sense of we wouldn't trade that day and that experience for anything. And, um, you know, if we were God, we would have written it differently and we can say that and we have permission to say that. And yet, even in that, we see his hand, we see his redemptive components, and we just see the gospel-infused reality of life in this present world, that that joy and, and sorrow, they can go together, yeah. and they can go exist, and oftentimes greater depths of one um, is paired with greater depths of the other, and that's what it is to love something right is the greater depths of love and joy that you experience in association with something the greater depths of pain that comes with um losing that something but um that doesn't negate the joy Mm -hmm. i remember reading a quote years ago now and i don't remember who it's by but something along the lines of anxiety is imagining the future without God's grace in it. Mm -hmm. And you really only feel God's grace in the present moment. So Mm -hmm. when we picture whatever scary day it is that we're imagining, whether we know what's going to happen, like the birth of a child who won't survive long after birth or something that we think is going to happen, when anxiety takes over, it's because we forget that God's grace is going to be there. And Mm -hmm. going back to what you said about taking the daily bread of each day, taking the manna of each day. We're not supposed to know tomorrow. We're not supposed to take tomorrow's bread. We're not supposed to understand how it's going to feel when God's grace meets us in that moment. We're so supposed to trust that it will. Um, And I've never heard, as you said, I haven't talked to as many parents as you guys have, but I've never heard a family regret that experience mm-hmm. and regret being able to meet their child, whether the child had already passed in the womb or whether the child lived minutes, hours after birth. God's grace has always met mm-hmm. them there yeah. and they've always been so grateful for that experience. And I yeah. think that's an important piece too, because this even, like if you step outside of sharing the same faith convictions and worldview that we share, you know, there's secular, you know, um, Duke University did a study that basically tracked like, hey, parents who get a life-limiting di- diagnosis, those who terminate versus those who continue, like what are the longer-term outcomes, like psychologically, emotionally, like who fares better? Is there a difference? And the study found that those that carry and continue 
fare better in the long run. And it's because of, you know, all of the things of like, hey, there's, of course, we're going to find stats that back up God's universal truths. But I think that because there was this, hey, we resisted the temptation to take matters into our own hands, to do what was right in our own eyes. Um, and we saw this through that as you're talking about regrets, I, I do think there's far less regrets associated because it's like, hey, we let this play out and we, we tried to be as, for, as informed as we could be, know our options, know the possibilities and not just walk through it with a blindfold. But at the same time, I think that absolutely contributes to the long-term sense of um, peace and absence of regrets as opposed to, uh, we talk about this often, like choosing to set the date that Abel was going to pass and end the pregnancy and have the abortion. Um, It really wouldn't have spared any of the sense of loss or suffering or it would have shortened the season of unknowns and all of those things, but you essentially get all of, all of the hard stuff and all of the sad stuff, and you've just forfeited all of the, the joyful, redemptive, redemptive stuff. Yeah, and hmm. that's not going to go well long term for anybody. Mm-hmm. And that's more than anything. Rather than because we've walked with folks of all different religions, um, no religion, you know, single moms, like name the circumstance that has been transcendent Mm -hmm. and 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 i think that's what it's rooted in ultimately yeah Yeah. and how long did abel live yeah so he lived for 15 days outside of the womb were you able to take him home yeah yeah. we were um which was like one of daniel's like prayers was that we would get to take him home and i was like oh man i don't know if we can take home a child that is you know and it felt like so overwhelming to me um but yeah, you quickly like learn all the medical things and how to do, you know, what you need to do to take care of your child. So we got to take him home, um, on day four and, um, got to spend the rest of his time, um, at home, which was like such a gift Mm -hmm. and, um, just to get to be a family in our own home, you know, um, was something that we never could have imagined getting to do with him. And, um, having people get to come see him and see us and things like that and just go to our favorite park around the corner and watch a movie that we love or, you know, um, things that are just like mundane things of life that we were never, um, we couldn't even like get our minds around the possibility of getting to do those things with him. And so, yeah, we, um, we didn't, um, I think, Again, like I said, we went, in, went into his birth just super open-handed and um, and we're hoping just for hours. And so I feel like the Lord um, gave us uh, more than we could have imagined or expected. And um, and then, yeah, I think on, on the piece about, like, grace, you know, I think that that is um, something that God used Abel's life to totally change the way that we approach our day to day, you know, in the best of ways, I think of just, and we really do, there's so much freedom in just going, you know what, like we have the next 24 hours and we can trust that God's going to give us what we need today. And that's really what Abel's 15 days looked like was just one day at a time. We're going to do what is before us and trust that God's going to give us the strength to do that. Um, and then he's going to give it for the next day and the next day. And even on the day that Abel passed away, you know, it's it's odd, but it, it really was like such a peaceful day for us. Um, I mean, it's the hardest day of our lives, too. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, I think getting to see, getting to know that Abel's like last breath on earth with us was like getting to meet our creator face to face. And that being your child is like unlike... And trying to get your mind around, like, what is that like? What is he actually experiencing? I think um, it was the worst day for us in a lot of ways, but the best day for him. Um, but, yeah, even on the day that he passed, you know, I, I think that, again, the Lord's presence was, like, just felt so, he was so near to us. Um, and uh, and we just trusted, like, hey, that this is the time that God wrote for him, you know, 
And of course, like Daniel said, if we were God, he'd still be here. And those two things can hold true, you know, at the same time, uh, which I think sometimes people have a hard time um, getting their minds around. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then how long after his birth and his death did you realize that you were being led to create this organization for other families? Because a lot of families have been through similar experiences, but not every family says, okay, there needs to be something else for families who have gone through this. So tell me about that. Yeah, you know, um, we didn't have any grand plans. So I would just say... um, about four months after Abel passed away, we had a friend of a friend reach out and say, you know, we were pretty open with our story when um, we were pregnant and during his life. And so they just said, hey, I know someone that got a similar diagnosis. Would you be willing to share your story with them? And just like any insight that you have on how to walk through something like this. And so um, we said yes. And And then that phone call just kind of kept coming every like three or four months. Somebody would reach out and say, hey, would you like connect with this family? And so we just thought it'd be like a family uh, ministry for us, you know, just like, hey, this is this is how we will continue to steward Abel's life. Like we don't get to parent him on earth in the way that we had hoped. But this is a way that we get to feel like we are still parenting him to some extent, you know, without the burden of like, we've got to do something. Yeah. Like we've got to preserve his legacy. We've got. Like there wasn't that sense of pressure. It was just, yeah, it's hard to even explain it. It was just a one step of faithfulness at a time. We want to be open to responding to opportunities that we feel like clearly the Lord's bringing to us to be faithful with. And then over time, as you're just picking up patterns, you're like, I don't think we're forcing this thing and trying to make fetch happen here. I think that it's just like, no, there's not only continuing opportunities and in, in need but also like pretty clear gaps that we, you know, at the time it's like we didn't know what we didn't know and we were learning as we were going. So there's some things to like pay forward. Um, But there's also stuff that was present that I think was easy to take for granted that we're like, oh, that's not, that's not normal. Like in the positive way of Mm -hmm. like, yeah, the support that we had, I think in that season, as we were walking with other families, we began to realize like, oh, that wasn't, our experience is not typical. And so a lot of families, um, even as they're like trying to decide, should they terminate? It's like, oh, the, the like understanding from a theological standpoint and just from a general education of what an abortion is and all of those things, there was just like no foundation there really. And so, um, all the way to like, Um, you know, how do we navigate this with like friends and family that are trying to love and support us, but they don't know what to say. They don't know how to say it. They don't know what to do, you know, um, maritally, how do we like navigate, you know, going through intense suffering and grief together, but also individually. And so there's just so many siblings, you know, people, we didn't have other children, but if the families had kids, it's like, how do we navigate grief with children, you know? Or sometimes people would start with enough of a conviction, like, hey, we're we're Catholic. Like, we don't do the abortion thing. That's yeah. a hard no. But what does it look like to actually follow through? It's like you just kind of grit your teeth and yeah. you, you get through it. And there's, like, a lack of, like, hey, here's, like, here's not just theologically as far as head-wise, but just, like, here's how you can navigate that season and just having – that redemptive perspective and a lot of the stuff we've talked about here Mm -hmm. for a while, there's can be a real deficit. And so that's relationally, maritally, medically. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like, we dread these appointments. We're having such a hard time. It's like, you know, you can find somebody else, like just really practical things that we're like, wow. Okay. We wouldn't have necessarily known to do this if this wasn't our story. Mm But to know that there is a different way, a better way, you do have choices, you do have options, um, and to be able yeah. to pass those things along. and um, There was just a lot of gaps in care and support mm-hmm. for such a niche population, you know. And even in our own story with Abel, I mean, we had some really difficult after he was born mm. um, where the medical team just expected him to die. And then when he didn't, they didn't really know what to do. Mm. And it was like... And I mean, ultimately it came down to like denying care, you know, Mm. are you sure that you want to feed him? And it's like, well, he's hungry. And, you know, um, 
And it's like, well, it's just futile. So, or if we, you know, wanted to learn more about how his heart was doing, it's like, that's just a futile thing to do. We don't recommend it. We won't have insurance cover that, you know, wow. like all of those things that we were totally unprepared for. Yeah. And so as we were walking with families, all of these things, um, we just saw patterns, like Daniel said, of like, oh, that's, um, I think there's a real need here. And so we decided um, to like formally establish Able Speaks um, in January of 2018 on what would have been Able's second birthday. And so we just thought it would be like 10 families a year in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Didn't think much um, beyond that. We didn't have like a three-year plan or a 10-year plan or anything like that for the ministry. Um, I was doing it, um, you know, part-time. Daniel was helping me on nights and weekends. And so we were just kind of making it work um, early on. And then in like 18 months, the ministry just like exploded. And so um, we were kind of looking at each other like, okay, either we need to go all in as a family on this and trust that this is what God's calling us to, if that's what we think. Um, or we need to like find somebody else to like start running it because we just don't have the margin. And so Daniel um, left his job um, in the fall of 2019, and we both started working for the ministry full time. And um, and yeah, since then we've served, like Daniel said, over 400 families, which is just crazy. Yeah. And um, in every U.S. state, eight different countries, and. Um, yeah, before, you know, Zoom was a thing, we were already using it, connecting with people, you know, across yeah. across the world. Real so, trailblazers. We yeah, were. that's right. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, Bring it on, COVID. No problem. <laughs> that's right. Uh, we were ready. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's... We've just tried to say yes to the next door that yeah. the Lord has opened and tried to be as faithful as possible to steward the story that he's given us. And... Yeah. Um, and it's been a, a huge gift to us just to get to, there's something very um, humbling and profound to get to walk with people through the darkest valleys, you mm-hmm. know, and for them to like share that with you is, yeah. um, is a huge gift and an honor. And, and so we really do view it that way. And, um, and just the way that the Lord uses the families that we get to walk with in our life. And I think it just keeps the, to the, in the forefront of our minds all the time. Like what we do keeps, um, it reminds us just, you know, of how futile life or, you know, how life is just so, um, it is like a vapor. Fleeting. It's mm-hmm. fleeting and it's just so um, short and yeah. that um, it helps keep an eternal perspective, you Definitely. know, um, for us and which we see as like a gift. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about just not just gaps in care, but also a lack of knowledge about these diagnoses and what the true options are. Some people don't even know that there is a redemptive option that mm-hmm. you can birth your baby whole and see their face and, right. and love them for their last moments or days of their life. Um, when we, read stories like we see in the media they're presented Mm -hmm. as kind of you know a a way to wield the culture war when you hear a story like the woman kate cox who traveled from texas i think she also her baby also had trisomy 18 and she wanted to have an abortion she did have an abortion and what you hear from the pro-choice side is that, of course, that's the most compassionate option. Of course, that right. is the best option to take. And it just goes to show, like, there is a lot of work to be done. For some people, maybe it's not a lack of knowledge. As you said, maybe, you know, for some people, they're just staunchly pro-abortion and they're yeah. for it no matter what. For some people, I mean, even those who consider themselves pro-life, they say, well, but in That's this right. case, in this case, yeah, I'm pro-life, but... It's the exception yes, to the rule, right? Yes, in this case, we have to allow it to happen. I saw that a lot. But you have seen now what it looks like for parents to choose the redemptive and life-giving mm-hmm. option. And there's just there's just a lot of work to be done, a yeah. lot of knowledge to be shared and wisdom to be shared. Of course, it requires heart change and all of that, but some people just don't have the information yeah. to know yeah. that it's even possible. I think, too, not... Like, um, I think we just don't understand suffering, 
you know? Mm. And so we don't, as humans, like we want to run away from hard things always. And I think that's just like our human instinct um, is to move away from it. But I think like what we've learned is like, if we sit in it and like trust that God is good and has a good plan and purpose for our life, um, I think we get to see the redemptive aspects of, of the suffering that he's given us. And if nothing else, you know, Abel's life has um, helped me know my creator more. Mm -hmm. And so if nothing else, like that is a humbling gift from my son, you know, Mm -hmm. that God has used his life um, to uh, allow me to know God more. And so in like a really personal way. And so I think that we just, um, even as believers, we don't have a good worldview on suffering and like how God uses it like I don't think God wants us to suffer but I also think that he knows our humanity you know and that that's often the the um best way to draw us into knowing and trusting him more yeah and And he didn't exempt himself I mean he didn't exempt Christ from that and so I do think that aversion to suffering or imposing what feels like imposing suffering on somebody else's a huge piece of what fuels that mostly well-intended but misguided compassion that you were talking about is because it's people and oftentimes believers that are like, hey, well, here's what is really the kind response Mm -hmm. or here's the most Christ-like, you know, here's the the most compassionate way to stance to take or way to respond. And and it does, it it doesn't take long to, in your world class at this, of just like, Okay, well, just consider, like, yes, I'm not, I'm not saying turn off your heart, but I'm saying turn on your mind and just here's a few questions. And can you see the inconsistencies of how um, that's maybe not actually, it might feel like or seem like on the surface the most compassionate response, but if A, B, and C are true, then that's actually, that doesn't, that doesn't line up. And so we've tried the best, you know, that we can. I, at the end of the day, we lead with our, our story and like I said up top, like, you know, I think one of the best apologetics we have as believers as a whole is just like, here's my story and what I've gleaned from it and your Mm -hmm. testimony. But I think as it applies to, you know, the pro-life movement or the abortion conversation, you know, I think sharing our story and our experience with Abel and uh, our work with Abel Speaks hopefully can just like people like, wow, I've never considered that or thought about that. And the little I did mm-hmm. think about it led me to this conclusion. Right. And now that I think about that, it's like, oh. And so that's like where we hang our hat at the end yeah. of the day. Mm-hmm. But we also are like, man, I do think it's important to have those foundational, fundamental, hey, think about these things now so that when the story and the headline that comes out that pulls on your heartstrings, be like, does that, does that line up though? And how can I balance grace how can i always have grace but also balance that with truth not at the cost of truth and so we did try and uh we put together like a quick little kind of short resource called uh four foundational questions about abortion um and it's on our website and stuff i think it's on our homepage right now where if you go to ablespeaks.org it pops up as a free download um just because we do kind of especially recently in light of you know our what's normally a very small off the radar niche kind of got pushed to the forefront of some national news with the Cox case the other month in Texas um, that it kind of the responses we saw from people, even as we, you know, would post things, it's like, Oh man, love this. Like agreeing with us, but also I think it's really good that everybody has like the ability and the right to, it's like, well, hold on yeah yeah i think the um the you know exception to the rule that our niche falls into for a lot of people even believers or people that are pro-life i think trying to equip people of like yeah but even in these circumstances you know this is what we can know to be true and um surrounding the abortion conversation but and also like daniel said you know we try to lead with man the things that we would have given up how we terminated abel's life ended his life um, you know, by our own accord is we wouldn't have known what he looked like. We wouldn't yeah. have gotten, we wouldn't have been able to hear his cry. We wouldn't have been able to give him a bath, you know? Mm. Um, 
our friends and family would have never gotten to meet him. I wouldn't have been able to feed him. There's so many things that we got to do with him because he is a human, you yeah. know, um, and he, his, he was alive, you know, and there's things that memories and things that we got to experience with him that those are the things that we would have given yeah. up had we chosen to end his life prematurely. Yeah, I totally agree that the testimony and the stories really are the counterpoint. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there isn't a place for like argument and debate, obviously. That's part of what I do. I think that's important. Yeah. But the showing the alternative, that there is redemption in the birth right. and that there is beauty, as you said, that joy and pain can actually co-mingle. Yeah. And really when you think about like we're so suffering averse, I mean, that has been true since the garden, whether right. it's suffering through like just impatience, having right. to wait for something, suffering through hardship, difficulty, yeah. rejection, whatever it is, Satan always says, but this thing that you can have right now right. is going to taste really good. And he mm -hmm. always downplays the consequences. Right consequences to that and never wants to show you what the joy of faithfulness can be. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's just an, a different iteration of the same temptation that humans have always faced, which yeah. is to take the easy way out, which easy way, I'm not saying it's easy for parents who go through that, but the seemingly quicker way right. to yes. avoid more to suffering. Avoid. Yeah. And then in the long run, it really does just compound the suffering. Right. That's right. Okay, last sponsor for the day, and that is NetSuite. This is specifically for business owners. So if you own a business, you need to listen up and you need to remember these three numbers. 37,000, 25, 1. 37,000, 25, 1. 37,000, that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. It is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turned 25 this year. This is 25 years of serving businesses, helping you do more with less, close your books in days, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators and one efficient system and one source of truth. This will make your life as a business owner so much better and easier. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash Allie. That's netsuite.com slash Allie to get your own KPI checklist, netsuite.com slash Allie. So Abel Speaks, I just want people in case they're in case they're looking and they want to know for sure, you offer mentorship, medical connections. You guys have covered all of this, maternity and birth photography, which I think is really special. And then you also have a podcast um, where you are answering a lot of commonly asked questions, uh, commemorative keepsakes. You help to create the, you know, the items that people can you know, save and be able yeah. to look at and remember their child and their birthday. You help with celebrations of life. You also have community retreats. So it's connecting a lot of people, both professionals and just the, you know, regular people going through it uh, mm -hmm. to resources and to each other to make sure that everyone is as informed and as encouraged and supported as possible, right? That's correct. Yeah. 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 And then all of those things, a common tie is, you know, ultimately helping families cherish their child, um, but also just being rooted in relationships and knowing that with whatever tangible, practical services and resources we can create and provide, because there's just, there's nothing. Like if you're on your own, it's like you, unless you're taking your own initiative and then it's like, okay, you're getting the best of what Google has to offer or Facebook groups that can be kind of hit or miss. And so trying to make it practical and, and helpful in yeah. that sense. But what transcends all of that is just the connections with other parents that totally. have walked through something similar. Um, and so Kelly's been very, she's our visionary and our executive director. And that's been something that just from the beginning has been a hallmark and always will be is um, yes to the resources, yes to the helpful things, but not just as like a resource hub of here, print this off or here you go. It's like, hey, not to dangle the carrot, just because genuinely we think the most impactful, transformative thing is going to be to connect you with other people. And yeah. so 
-hmm. That informs all of what we do. And so that's yeah. us. Those 400 families are 400 families that are getting, you know, personally, relationally connected and yeah. being a part of a community and, a, you know, a cohort that nobody like shoots their hand up to want to be in that club. But to know that you're not the first and you won't be the last and you're not alone is uh, is a game changer. Yeah. yeah. What we often say is that support changes stories. And so that's what we, and we see that through relationships primarily. And so, and something that we often hear is like pushback is like, hey, that's great that you chose that and you had a good experience. But I know, you know, my friend chose to continue the pregnancy and it was a horrible traumatic experience. And for me, what we often say is just like, man, that makes me so sad because all that says to me is that they didn't have proper support mm -hmm. because we walked with 400 families that all did have proper support, and so they don't regret their decision to continue. And so, as Daniel said, we really um, try to uh, provide every opportunity we can to connect relationally with us, with our staff, as well as like with one another, because we really have found that that community and that relationship is really what um, transforms their um, heart and mind to be able to uh, have a different uh, category and approach to something like this, you know, and it's usually we might be the first people that say to them like, hey, there is a different way and mm -hmm. there is a different option and let us show you what it looks like to walk through that. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Well, thank you guys so much for what you do. And it's ablespeaks.org, A-B-E-L speaks.org. If anyone just wants to learn more, if you have been through it, maybe you can uh, serve as a resource and a form of support for someone else. Or if you're in this current situation, there are a lot of people who follow me who are in the situation right now, mm -hmm. who maybe they saw me post about Able Speaks on Instagram and their lives have been changed for the better because of that. So, and this is a, this is generational impact too, because it has an effect not just on parents, but also their own parents, the grandparents that are involved, That's the brothers right. and sisters and I mean, this is the kind of thing that carries on. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah. And just a, a little fun aside, Kelly yeah. is part of the reason, honestly, like part of the reason why I was able to have a VBAC after two C-sections. Oh, and so oh. I might have mentioned to you not by not by name when I was sharing my birth story, but you had a VBAC after three That's C right, sections. Three C sections. And so I think I saw you post about it. I think I follow Able Speaks. And so I saw Able Speaks maybe repost your post. And I was yeah. like, I'll be back after three C sections. And so I reached out to Kelly yeah. and she told me who she used, doula connected me to all the right people and then I was able to have a VBAC and well, so that's generous. Yes. You did it. So oh, um but well, yeah it's fun for me to get to um you know, it, it's it's a journey to be yes. able to have a VBAC. So I love yes. sharing with other people. Um, After three C-sections, like that is, yeah. uh, and for some people, they think that that is unheard of. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many people said that to me. I've what? never heard of yeah. anyone, you know, even people that are in like the birth world and, and as yeah. like their profession. They're like, I've never even heard of that. Um, so, yeah, it was, um, I'm grateful to have found, you know, live in a city where there were people that were willing to, um, yeah, to, um, walk with me through that. But yeah, it was really fun to get to share with you and, um, and just to get to hear that you did it, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's a, I think people don't fully understand that it is, um, it's not easy. It is well, a, it's mentally, mentally, I mean, it is hard, I've you know, some yes. profound like performances in life and feats of human strength. And yeah. I don't think any of it trumps that day. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and I mean, all, all birth, whether it's C-section or whether mm -hmm. it's a uh, vaginal birth or epidural or not, there are difficulties with all of it, but you yeah. having to be back after three C-sections yes. with no epidural <laughs> is right. like, that is worth celebrating. Oh, Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. And I don't know how you feel about this, but there were people in my life who were concerned, obviously, uh -huh. with me yes, having to be back, including my parents. Yeah. But I would always use your story. I'd be oh, like, my yeah, gosh. But I love that. There is this woman that I know she who had to be back after three C-sections. Yeah. Yes, right. And she went, you went to almost 43 weeks. weeks. And so I would tell everyone, my in-laws and everyone around me, when I was nearing <laughs> oh gosh, 42 weeks, that. who were all, like, really worried. I was like, yeah, but I know someone who went to almost 43 I love weeks. That so much. And we did, did the it. thing of, like, hey, with our big kids, like, go stay with grandma and grandpa for yeah. this week. Thank you, guys. Cause yes. 
at the latest, it'll be that. And it's like, that yeah. week came and went. And, and they the came back around. And, and I was like, I'm not had that baby. I That's totally right. understand that. My in laws came. We were like, yeah, just come at 39 weeks. Yeah. Just, you just never know. It's yeah. the third baby. Definitely, this baby will come <laughs> earlier. That's right. And then I'm like, I felt, I mean, they're amazing. So they never made us feel bad at all. But they were there. I was like, okay, Just feeding. 40 weeks, it'll be soon. And yes. then they're still there. They're still there. And they ended up staying for a long time, which was amazing. Wow. But yes. yes, that waiting game. And it then to mentally. have the V. But you have to overcome so many obstacles. Yeah. But I'm it's sure so also. It's so nuanced, you know. Yes. And it, yes. so there's so many things that you're like, I don't know how it's going to go. But honestly, you know what? I feel like Abel's life. I, I felt like made that journey so much easier for yes. me. Because yes. I was like, you know what? It's one day at a time. And I'm just yeah. going to take it one day at a time and I'm not going to worry about the next day. And uh, I trusted the Lord knew what day his birthday was going to be on. And I just kept like reminding myself of that every day, you know, of, um, of especially that last week where I was just like, is he, is this baby ever going to come? You know? I know. Um, and so, and even on that point, like I hope and trust that like God, you know, uses this conversation of if somebody's made it this far in the recording and this has nothing to do, it's like, I'm not even married. Like this is not yeah. the waters I'm swimming in that, that you're able to see and God's spirit is able to nudge you just with reminders of like, Hey, your circumstances that I've, you know, the things that make no sense that are confusing, that are hard to reconcile with my nature that make you want to pull away from me. Like these are ever present opportunities to be, reminded of to to personally in the most undesirable of ways experience the truths and the realities that that transcend our circumstances and our sufferings and so that's certainly our hope and our prayer is whatever level of equipping and awareness around like oh yeah I've maybe heard of stuff like that loosely I didn't realize how often it happens that now you can know if a friend or a loved one, you know, ever gets a diagnosis like that. Hey, there is an organization that exists. Even if the doctor mentioned nothing about it, um, let them know we're out there and exist to support them and walk with them. And then uh, and then also just in that transcendent way that yeah. the principles and the things that we can share about walking through Abel's life and walking alongside other people in hardship and in the unknown is uh, applicable with ever whatever it is that you're walking through right now yeah. and mm -hmm. so know that believe that he sees you he cares for you uh you're not alone and he's not forgotten you mm. thank you so much amen all oh. right thanks for having thanks, us Allie. yes thank you it's fun